prayer this morning, either standing, sitting, coming to the altar, kneeling before, may you just spend the next few moments in prayer this morning. campus we started today with prayer in our classrooms started the service this morning with prayer and Lord just like the first song we sang will you guide me when I can't see Lord, in order for you to guide us, we've got to submit to you and surrender to you. To you, our great God. And may we long for only you May our steps, may you guard our steps, may you guard our minds as we put our faith and our trust in you to get us simply from point A to point B. And may we continue worshiping you because you are great and you are greatly to be praised. Grant us our prayer. It's in Jesus' name. And amen. As we sing. The splendor of the King Clothed in majesty Let all the earth rejoice All the earth rejoice
to you this morning. We thank you, Lord, for being in our midst this morning. We thank you that we've been able to praise you through song. We've been able to praise you through prayer. And now we're going to worship you through the word. And I pray right now that you would open the lips of Pastor Styles as he proclaims the word. May, may he proclaim it boldly not holding back the word that you have placed here for us today. And may we respond obediently. It's in Jesus' name we pray, and amen. I'm glad to be here, and it's always an honor when I get the opportunity and am invited to, to preach to the students. I've been a student as an alumni of this institution and um, I, I know what it's like sitting there, and uh, sometimes it's a struggle, or at least it was for me, maybe it's not for you, many of you are probably more spiritual than I was as a student, uh, to uh, divide the academic requirement from the spiritual necessity uh, that is chapel and student-led revivals and things like that. And so anytime I, I, I said this to myself as a student, if I ever get the opportunity to preach in front of the student body, uh, I always want to preach something that's applicable to your life. I don't ever want you to feel like I'm preaching, uh, trying to, to demonstrate my knowledge or my ability or my skills, uh, but you would be able to walk away from a sermon uh, and be able to apply it to your life. And I believe, if you have your Bibles with me and open to the book of Second Chronicles chapter 29, uh, the Lord has not only something that's applicable for you, um, but applicable to any believer that is born again and it is in desire of revival in their life, in their church, in their nation. Uh, I went back and listened to our brother yesterday. I wasn't able to be here in person. I had a meeting at a 11 o'clock I had to attend to. Uh, but I went back and listened to him, and uh, I walked away uh, with his view of what I would call a micro understand or a macro understanding of revival. He spoke about big revivals and grand revivals, and for certain we need big and grand revivals. We need a nation that would turn itself back to God. Uh, if I can be honest with you, we just need Southern Baptist churches that will turn themselves back to God. And as I speak to you this morning, I want you to understand I'm going to preach to you and speak to you. Uh, I'm going to say the things to you that I wish I could say to uh, the church. And those of you that have pastored for a little while, you know when you get up there and you preach, there's some things... Uh, that is hard to say to the church because you know they're just going to turn you off and, and walk away from it. But you all are going to stand in pulpits one day. Ladies, you all are going to go out and be in some kind of evangelism or a Sunday school class or, uh, or come alongside a WMU leadership. Uh, men, you're going to go out and preach the gospel. Uh, hopefully, men and women, you're all going to go out and evangelize. Um, and so when we talk about revival, we oftentimes, and Lord, we love seeing the macro revivals. We love seeing large-scale, grand-scale, turning whole nations, turning their eyes back to the Lord. Whole churches, whole denominations coming back to the Lord. But I want to challenge you this morning, if I can remove the telescope of revival that we looked at yesterday and bring in the microscope of revival today, if I could focus you on macro uh, or micro, not macro, revival. 
I want to look at the individual this morning. Because I fully believe that in order to get to the point that we see a macro revival where the whole nation or whole churches, it's going to begin with individuals. It's going to begin with us individually and as leaders of the ministries that the Lord has placed us in. And so in Second Chronicles chapter 29, I want to talk to you about this. I want to talk to you about this question. I want to ask this question to you. What is the top priority of your life? Now, be real careful before you answer that because the Spirit of God's listening to you. It's real easy to say as a Bible college student, as a professor, as a, as a teacher, as an administrator, my top priority is to serve my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's easy to say. But friends, I want you to, before you answer that question, start thinking about your daily activities and how you live your life out. And when you begin to think about your daily activities and your daily routine, and you go to that default answer of, I want to serve my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, do your activities, do your actions line up with what you claim to be your top priority? See, I believe God gave us the books of First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, because it shows us the fickleness of humanity. I mean, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, oftentimes is not focused on the Gentile world, or as we would say in the New Testament, the lost world, it's focused on the people who are supposed to be God's people. It's focused, it's focused on the nations of Israel and Judah. It's focused on these people that the law of God was delivered to, that the people who should have had a relationship with the Lord. And what we see in First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles, we see them hit high points in their relationship with the Lord, and we see them walk away from the Lord, and we see them come back with the Lord, and we see them walk away from the Lord, and we see them come back to the Lord and walk away from the Lord. And I believe wholeheartedly we can see in our own lives and in our own churches the fickleness of the human heart, the fickleness of people who claim to know the Lord, claim to have a relationship with the Lord, Yet not always is the Lord the top priority of their lives. And so if I'm speaking to you this morning, and if I'm not speaking to you today, may I give you this word of advice from someone who's uh, currently pastoring. I will be speaking to you one day. Because in pastoring, it's so easy to lose sight of your top priority. This is not coming from a megachurch pastor where I've got 15 different people that can help carry the load of the burden. This is coming from a bivocational pastor, which, by the way, most of our Southern Baptist churches are leaning more and more into bivocational ministry. And even those that are called full-time ministry, most of those are only made up of just a handful, one or two people that are full-time ministers carrying the load. It's easy to get lost in what the top priority is in ministry. And so if I'm not speaking to you today, here's what I can promise you. I will be speaking to you one day in your ministry. Because sooner or later, you're going to allow things to get your eyes off the top priority. Not that you don't know what it is, but that your actions and the way you're leading your ministry don't align with what the top priority is. And so this morning, I want us to focus on ourselves through the individual that we see here in Scripture. He goes by the name of Hezekiah, the top priority in your life. Let me ask the Lord to bless our time together and then we'll dive in this morning. Father, we come to you. God, I pray, Lord, that you would speak to our hearts. And Father, as our brother blessed us and reminded us, Lord, that you move in grand and mighty ways. And God, you are capable of bringing about a revival that returns our nation to you, bringing about a revival that returns our churches to you, bringing about a revival that returns our colleges to you. Father, I pray you would take this message that we see today and recognize, Lord, that that begins with us as individual believers, with us as a people of God, individually determining in our hearts, Lord, that we desire to be revived. And God, not that we just desire to be revived, but Lord, we will do it your way. God, that we will come your way, not man's way, not the way we want, but Father, we will listen to the precepts of Scripture this morning and God, we will walk the old rugged path that our forerunner in heaven, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, blazed for us. And Father, I pray that each and every one of us, Lord, that are in need of revival this morning, Father, that we wouldn't leave here saying, man, 
we'll just wait till the grain scale revival comes along. God, may we recognize that until the grain scan, uh, scheme of revival comes along, Lord, we have a responsibility to you. God, we have responsibility to the ministries you've entrusted to us. Father, that we would find ourselves individually revived and ready for ministry. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you want serving the Lord, and if you desire student-led revival, that's what we labeled this, if you really desire the student body, the administration, the faculty of Clear Creek Baptist Bible College to be revived, if that's your genuine desire, maybe not, maybe this is just an academic requirement you're walking through, but if you really want revival, I believe we're going to see three key principles that we can follow here in this text. Number one, I want you to understand this. If you want revival in your life, you've got to rededicate God's covenant in your life. Uh, look at what it says here in 2 Chronicles 29, verses 10 and 11. We run into this man by the name of Hezekiah. Give you a quick history. If you don't know what's happened before then, his father Ahaz was a wicked king, r- wicked ruler, ruled for many years. And the Bible tells us that he literally shut down temple worship. This is Old Testament covenant, y'all. That would be like shutting down your churches. We don't know what that's like with COVID, do we? Uh, But that would be what this is. Literally, Ahaz, the previous king, shut down coming to church. Shut down worshiping God. And then took it a step further and said, Now we're not going to worship Yahweh anymore. We're going to worship these false gods of these foreign nations. That's what Hezekiah is coming into. And on top of that... Hezekiah's got a lot of political issues. He's got enemies on all sides. He's got a lot of social issues uh, that, that is internal strife within uh, the, the economy and the people of Israel. He's got economic issues, and we don't know what any of that feels like in our day, do we? We live in a politically uh, wonderful society. We don't have any social issues. There's no uh, social issues in America today. We don't have any economic issues. None of y'all need any more money, right? I mean... We live in these days that we see Hezekiah experiencing. But I want you to notice this. Hezekiah, the Bible's going to tell us here in the first few verses of 2 Chronicles 29, his first response is not a political response. It's not a social response. It's not an economic relief plan. Hezekiah said, we can fix all those issues, but the first thing we need is a spiritual revival in our land. And so the first thing he does here is he rededicates the people to God's covenant. Look at verses 10 and 11. Thus is Hezekiah speaking to the Levites, the priests of God's temple. He says, Now it is in my heart to make a covenant with the Lord God of Israel, that his fierce wrath may be turned away from us. My sons, be not now negligent, for the Lord hath chosen you to stand before him, to serve him, and that you should minister unto him and burn Incense. Again, Hezekiah is speaking to the priest of those days. Now, uh, we're dividing the covenants here. Old Testament covenant, you've got the Levitical priest line that was the uh, spiritual leadership of the nation. Uh, when we talk about how does that parallel to New Testament, well, I'm glad you asked. You know, the Bible says that you are a royal priesthood. The Bible says that you have been called into the priesthood not of a commandment that was made by carnal means, but by the order of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, an eternal priesthood. Friends, uh, you don't need the Pope. You don't need a vicar. You don't need somebody else to get you to the Lord. If you've been called into the ministry, you've been called to minister for Him. Friends, you've been put up under the supreme potentate, the Lord Jesus Christ Himself, called into ministry. And friends, I can promise you this, there's going to be times in your ministry where people are going to stray from God's covenant. The New Testament and the Old Testament are still based upon God's covenant with His people. And we notice here, these people have strayed. But notice, not only have these people strayed, the Levites themselves have strayed from worshiping the Lord. Hezekiah comes to the throne. He says, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to reconnect. I'm going to rededicate God's covenant, not just in the people's hearts, but in the people who are supposed to be preaching to the people's hearts. As you prepare for ministry, let me ask you this question. Has the Bible turned not just into 
a spiritual connection between you and your Lord, but has it turned into just an academic pursuit? Has it turned into just grading assignments and reading a book and reading a chapter and doing Bible chapter summaries? If that's the case in your heart this morning and the the last time that you picked up God's Word, you can't remember the last time you opened it, turned the pages, and the Word of God, as Paul would say, began stirring up that which was within you. You can't remember the last time you sat in a chapel or in a preaching sermon without critiquing and picking apart the speaker. If you can't remember those things, friends, you are in the same situation of these Levites. You are in desperate need of rededicating yourself to the covenant of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, of bringing yourself back under His direction. And notice this in verse 10. He says, It's in my heart to make a covenant with the Lord of Israel. Why? That His fierce wrath may turn away from us. The purpose of rededicating ourselves is so that we remove ourselves from the correcting and chastising hand of the Lord Savior Jesus Christ, which, by the way, the writer of Hebrews says he chastens any that he loves. And in fact, if he doesn't chasten you, then you're an illegitimate son. In other words, you're not even saved. So if you're experiencing the chastening hand of God's friend, it's not because he doesn't love you. It's actually because he loves you, and it's the fact that he's trying to redirect you back into covenant relationship with him again. I don't spank my children or discipline my children because I want them to run away from me. I spank and discipline my children because I want them to run to me. That's what Hezekiah says here. He says, I want to rededicate this covenant so that away the fierce wrath of our Lord. In other words, if we get spiritually right, Hezekiah says the Lord will take care of our political problems. If we get spiritually right, he will take care of our social problems. If we get spiritually right, the Lord will take care of our economic problems. And that's what we see here. Look at verse 11. He says, my sons, now listen to this word, be not now negligent. Be not now negligent. I'm the dean of administration, so that word negligent is very important to me. Because if there's negligence found on our campus, guess who's responsible for that? I am. If there's negligence found in our campus, guess what happens? It ends up costing our institution dollars that could be used for missional purposes, but now we've got to use them because we were negligent in this area. It's a heartfelt desire to see a situation change, and here's what I know about revival. People oftentimes have a heartfelt desire for revival. If I were to ask the question, does anybody in here want revival today? We'd all raise our hands. We have a heartfelt revival, but no... Notice this, it's not just a heartfelt desire, listen to this, to see the situation change. And it's that second part that I think we struggle with with humanity. We want the heartfelt revival. We want God coming down and meeting with us. We want to have a closer relationship. We just don't want to see the situation change. Hezekiah said we can't do that. We can't allow our negligence. And look what he says here in two ways. He says, number one, in representation. Look at verse 11. My sons, be not now negligent, for the Lord hath chosen you to stand before him. Remember, Old Testament covenant, Levites, he's chosen you to stand before him. Literally in the temple complex with the holy of holies as their background. God has chosen you out of the nation. And and friends, if God has saved your soul in the New Testament covenant, hear me this morning, he's chosen you. He's chosen you, and He didn't just choose you to save you. He chose you that not only would He save you, but He'd put you in His ministry. That you would be responsible for telling somebody else the good news of Jesus Christ. And if you have walked away, and if you've allowed that top priority to become secondary, tertiary, or maybe even in the back burner of your life, then, friends, you're in desperate need of revival because not only are you hurting your spiritual walk, but, friends, you're hurting the ministry that God's placed you in. So there's a representation here. Number two, he says also in service. Look at this. He says he's chosen you to stand before him. Notice this, to serve and that you should minister unto him and burn incense. Not only is there a representation aspect here, but there's a service that's required upon the people. 
Hezekiah desires to bring about a rededication of God's covenant because he understands if he doesn't do that, then God's anger and God's discipline will continue to pour out on the nation. And we know that after Hezekiah's day, we will see that happen because in 586 B.C., the Babylonians will come in and wipe Judah from off the face of the earth. You say, Brother Jerry, God doesn't act, work that way in the New Testament. There's a little city called A-Chain over in Europe. During World War II, it was Nazi-occupied and controlled. The Nazis controlled this city, and towards the end of the war, it was obvious that Germany was going to fall, that the uh, Allied forces were going to win, and so they surrounded the city of A-Chain, and they put parachuters that would drop pamphlets and planes that would fly over and drop pamphlets into the city of A-Chain, and it literally said, we have you surrounded Understand that we don't want any innocents to be hurt or, or mangled. If you will just turn over, if you will just expel, if you will just surrender your city, no one else has to suffer. You're completely surrounded. No help's coming. No help's coming. The city of A-Chain decided not to surrender, and in the next morning, bombing ensued and leveled the city streets. You say God doesn't work that way in the New Testament. You go read Revelation chapter 1 and 2. Revelation chapter 1, we see God standing in the midst of the candlesticks, and the Bible tells us that those candlesticks represent the seven churches. You go read Revelation chapter 2 and hear what he tells to the church of Ephesus. Because you've lost your first love, if you do not repent and you do not return, I will take your candlestick and remove it. What does that mean? I will end your service in ministry. Friends, God, God doesn't play around when it comes to ministry. God's gracious. God's suffer, long-suffering. God has mercy. God is all those things. But let's also see the other side of the coin. God understands far more than you and I do that when you and I don't rededicate our lives to His covenant, and when you and I allow the thing that should be top priority to slip in our lives, God understands that doesn't just affect us, but that affects the lost world He's trying to reach to. And if you're going to be too stubborn to repent of that, and if you're going to be too prideful to lower yourselves before God, don't think that God won't snuff out your ministry and put somebody in there who will accomplish His will and His purpose. First thing we've got to do is rededicate ourselves to God's covenant. Number two, I want you to see this. We've got to reinstitute God's way. Reinstitute God's way. Look at verses 17 and 18 with me. After he declares this, notice what happens. The Bible says, verse 17, now they began on the first day of the first month. Now, what's that time period? You go back and read. I don't have time to go through all this. You go back and read. This is the beginning of Hezekiah's reign. When did this start? Not a, few, not, not a few days later, not 90 days later, not day one. This was Hezekiah's mandate to the people. Now they began on the first day of the first month, listen to this, to sanctify, and on the eighth day of the month came they to the porch of the Lord. So they sanctified the house of the Lord in eight days. That's talking about the temple complex, from the Holy of Holies to the temple complex, and now they're going to move out from there. The Bible says, Then they went into Hezekiah the king and said, We have cleansed all the house of the Lord. Sixteen days they cleansed all of it, uh, and the altar of burnt offering with all the vessels thereof, and the showbread and the table, and all the vessels thereof. So uh, after Hezekiah calls them back into covenant relationship with the Lord, what's the next step? The next step begins what we call the sanctification process. That's what they're doing here. They're sanctifying it. What does that mean? That means to purge it, to remove that which is filthy. Look at verse 16 with me. The Bible says, And the priest went into the inner part of the house of the Lord, listen to this, to cleanse it and brought out all the uncleanness that they found in the temple of the Lord. Okay, let's bring that into New Testament terminology. Where is the temple of the Lord housed in the New Testament? In us. Paul tells us that Know ye not that your bodies are the temple of the Lord, that the Holy Spirit indwells in you? Not a brick-and-mortar building, not a place 
but within the believer's life. And in order to rededicate ourselves to God's covenant, we have to reinstitute God's ways in our lives. We have to find those areas where we walked away and stopped doing what God called us to do and start doing those things while also removing the filth and the sin in our lives. How many of you all, and all of y'all probably saw our chapel before now, before it is now to the way it the old way was. How many of y'all have, have seen the old chapel and the new chapel? Okay, raising of hands again. How many of y'all would say, from any way that you want to judge it, aesthetically, technology, uh, anything you want to do, branding, how many of y'all would say the new chapel is far better than our old chapel? Okay, okay. <laughs> now, I'm not going to give you any direct numbers here because the president would kill me. <laughs> but you understand that to do everything we did here cost money, lots of money, tens of thousands of dollars to do this. Now, we had great donors that helped us. We didn't have to incur all that cost. But we as the college had to invest thousands, tens of thousands of dollars just to do what you see within these walls right here. With as beautiful as that is, can you imagine, when you go back and read in Scripture how beautiful the temple of God was. You go back in Scripture and read about how valuable it was. Can you imagine if I just came in here and I took my trash out of my office and said, you know what? That's a good place to put it. Anytime somebody goes in here and worships, anytime somebody gathers together, they can sit there and look at my trash. All this money that's been expended upon bringing a better presence and, and having a better chapel experience and, and a desire to honor God, could you imagine if not only did I dump it there, but then I said I left it there and now we're going to have service and we're going to worship God with my trash on the floor. We'd all say, well, that's insane. That's crazy. And some of y'all are probably thinking, you'll be lucky if Charlie doesn't fire you when you get done with this. <laughs> because he knows how much went into this. He knows how much was invested in this. Now, y'all come up here real close. How much more precious, how much more valuable is the spotless Lamb of God who laid down his life, not just for your sins, but the Bible says he was the propitiation for our sins, but not ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. Now remember, here's your illustration. They've got to clean the filth out of the temple. Where's the temple in the New Testament? It resides in the believer. How much more valuable is the precious blood of the Lamb of God and how much more disgusting do you think it is when we junk it up with our sin? I don't mean to take this. I don't mean anybody to disturb anybody or hurt anybody. And i got to go because, as usual, I preach longer than I need to. If somebody's been in an abusive relationship or been through that, I, I don't mean to bring up bad memories or anything like that. But do you know what a, an abuser does? Psychological, physical, sexual abuser. You know what an abuser does? They abuse their victim, and then they'll apologize for it. But they apologize knowing that they're going to turn around and abuse them again. You know what we do oftentimes with our sin? We throw it into the temple of God, into our lives. We throw it down into God's face. And then when we feel guilty about it, we say, Lord, I'm sorry. Let me just be honest with you. God delivered me from the clutches and sin of pornography. But before then, you know what I would do? I would go and I would watch and I would participate in pornography. I'd feel guilty about it and I'd say, God, I'm sorry that I did that, knowing full well that I was going to run back to the mud. Use the mercy and grace of God in our lives. 
You want to get upset about physical abuse? Absolutely we should. Sexual abuse? Absolutely we should. Mental, emotional abuse? Absolutely we should. But before we get all upset about that, maybe we should get upset about the abuse that we do to God when we say, God, forgive me of my trash, but I don't plan on picking it up. Hezekiah said, not only am I, are we going to rededicate the covenant, but he said, we are going to reinstitute God's way in our life. We're going to, if it's going to be top priority, we're going to do it God's way, not my way. Lastly, I want you to see this. When they rededicated God's covenant, when they reinstituted God's way, when they cleaned out the trash, look at what it says, verse 31 and 36. The Bible says this. It says, Then Hezekiah answered and said, Now you have consecrated yourselves unto the Lord. Listen to this. Come near and bring sacrifices and thanks offerings into the house of God. And the congregation brought in sacrifices and thank offerings, and as many were as free of heart burn offerings. Look at verse 36. And Hezekiah rejoiced in all the people that God had prepared the people, for the thing was done suddenly. So when we rededicate ourselves to God's covenant, reinstitute His ways, the third thing that we got to do is it revitalizes our worship. Notice what Hezekiah did here. Hezekiah, this, and this is what we often do. We want the sudden impact of God in our lives. We want that out of the blue, removing the heavens, shining glory of God to just come down and suddenly fall on our lives. But I want you to see, that didn't happen here. Hezekiah started on the first day saying, this is what we want. It took 16 days just to clean out all the garbage of the temple and now Hezekiah says that all the garbage has been cleaned out. Now that we've rededicated the covenant, now that we've reinstituted God's ways, now we can have worship. Now we can come to church. Now we can gather together. Now we can worship God. Bring your offerings. Bring your sacrifices. Bring your worship. And notice what the Bible says. It said the people rejoiced because the matter happened suddenly. What were they talking about that happened suddenly? It wasn't the fact that when Nehemiah desired God's presence, that God's presence just immediately showed up in Hezekiah's life and in the life of the people. But it was the fact that they desired God's presence and were, listen to me, willing to go through the sanctification process. You cannot, you will not have the sudden presence of God in your life until you've gone through the sanctifying process of God. You can grow through correction. You go back and think if you had correcting, disciplining parents in your life, you can grow through correction. When you get on the other side of correction, you can grow in your relationship. But there ain't even been a single time, friends, where you grew in correction. What I mean is when they were correcting you, that pain, that hurt, it, it was meant to cause you to think about what led me here. And when you get through that correction, you say, I don't want to go back to that pain and hurt anymore, so I'm not going to do this anymore. And your relationship grows because now you're not having to be corrected because you're living the right and proper manner. The same is true here. People want the sudden experience of God, but they're unwilling to go through His sanctifying process. It took the people 16 days, 16 days, until the hand of God showed up. And while we talked about macro revivals and all these movements of God yesterday, if we could go back into those individuals' lives who God used, I would bet a bottom dollar, if betting wasn't a sin, I would bet my bottom dollar that those individuals went through a sanctifying process before God showed up. And friends, what's your top priority? What's your top priority? When the end of these student-led revivals come, are we just going to walk away and say, well, we had another student-led revival. We critiqued the pastor while he was up there, and we walked away from it unchanged, unmoved. But God's still the top priority in my life. Still got this trash in the background. Or are we going to walk away from it saying, you know what? 
after these student-led revivals, when we show up that next Tuesday for chapel and Thursday after that, and when I'm in my church on Wednesday night, and when I'm at my church on Sunday morning, and when I'm at the grocery store on Monday and Tuesday, man, I want a revitalized worship, a revitalized experience, a revitalized moving of God on my life because I have rededicated God's covenant. I've reinstituted God's ways. I didn't do it haphazardly. I didn't do it in some mystical experience. But now God has shown up in my life. And if he's shown up in my life, he's done it so I can reach others. So I ask you, what is your top priority? With every head bowed and every eye closed, as we come to this point of invitation, we've got a few minutes left before we dismiss. And as our singers and come to give us a point of invitation, I want you to think about what Hezekiah did. One man, one man who desired... Not just God to touch his life, but for God to change his nation. First thing he did, rededicate God's covenant. Where are you in your walk with the Lord? The writer of Hebrews reminds his people that because of the great high priest of our Lord and Savior, you can go read it, Hebrews chapter 8, because of him, you can draw nigh unto God. You can draw nigh. Not not into a temple compound or a complex. He tells us in Hebrews chapter 4 that we can go into the very throne room of heaven boldly. But friend, where are you? Where are you in your covenant relationship with the Lord? Number two, any trash filling up your temple? Any sin getting in the way of your worship? Any trash that just simply needs to be removed and allow the reinstitution of God's way in your life. You need to spend some time in a sanctifying process, allowing God just to get you right, so that way you can stand in front of other people and revitalize their lives. Number three, when's the last time you've experienced a revitalized worship experience? Not one that you put on. Not one that the outward world saw but one that you know on the inside and inner recesses of your heart and your soul, the Spirit of God applauded. And the Spirit of God, the Bible says, that He inhabits the praises of His people and you revitalized your worship. Friends, if that's not where you are, can I tell you, don't expect a sudden revival. Don't expect it. Until you've gone through the sanctifying process of our Lord and Savior. Father, we come to you, Lord, as we open up this altar. God, I pray as you have your way in the lives of our students, our faculty, and our staff. Father, I pray may we not be stubborn. God, may we not quench the Spirit of God. But God, may we desire genuine, real revival. Not something that's emotional or, or something that 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 is just fleeting, but something, Lord, that changes the course of our lives. A revival, a renewal, a rededication. Father, I pray that you would work in my life. God, may we experience revitalized worship in the life of our campus here. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The altar's open. You come. Tis